rather than try and put out the fires or, or the uh, potential misinformation or the misunderstandings, right. just to be generous towards people, the misunderstandings that we encounter in our offices and feel like we're playing whack-a-mole every single day, we really need to be proactive with our messaging and try and reach yeah. the wider public before they come into our offices as doctors and yeah. really be responsible and mindful about how we're educated. You mentioned education earlier. I mean, you can look at that as a, another educational responsibility, right? We train future physicians, we train students in health professions, but we can also help to educate our wider population. And I think social media is a great platform to do so. So I am so excited to talk about COVID more but with a, a different perspective is from an immunologist. We have Dr. Basil Kowash. He's a board certified allergist and immunologist and assistant professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Remember that song, Tennessee? That was your jam, I think, right? That was my uh, jam. That's right. You're going to sing it I'm not familiar no. with that song. Oh, man. Oh, I, I, I see. Sing it. Because we're talking about, um, who are we talking about again? Rest of Development? No. What's that Rest of Development, yeah. Yeah. And Mr. Wendell. Mr. Wendell Mr. actually Wendell. was based on Clinton. We'll talk about that later. But that's actually, Clinton is Mr. Wendell. Anywho, welcome welcome back to Recommended Daily Dose. I am Dr. Clinton Coleman, along with the 80s child, Dr. Saras Sucker. He's probably 70s, I think, more, more so. In 90s, 90s grunge when I had long hair, you know. But more importantly, we have someone very important to talk to today. So he, he is way better at social media than either one of us. Um, mm -hmm. So we do want to get his thoughts on social media uh, as well as speaking about social issues without being too uh, controversial. But um, I think what's most important is getting his perspective as an immunologist on, on COVID. So we've heard from the infectious disease guy, but we want to hear from the, the real expert. So welcome, Dr. Kawash. How are you today? I'm doing great, Dr. Coleman, Dr. Cigar. How are you both? Good. We are excellent. Thanks for joining us today. So tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you're down in Tennessee, in Nashville specifically, um, at Vanderbilt. So uh, already a professor. Tell us a little bit about your journey into medicine. Yeah, so I'm a uh, allergist immunologist, board certified as of last fall. So this, uh, you know, an allergist immunologist treats allergies, of course, which is one manifestation of immune disease, but we're really specialists in the entire immune system, which is the body's mechanism of protecting us from infections and also uh, maintaining the, the regulation of a lot of different processes that happen within our bodies. That's what we focus on right there as allergists and as clinical immunologists. Um, uh, my role as an assistant professor, I'm the director of quality improvement here at our clinic. So I oversee a few different projects, uh, especially those that are being run by fellows within our fellowship program to try and improve both the educational program and the workflow in our clinic. I'm also the director of resident education, which is a lot of fun. I get to manage the curriculum of the residents rotating through here, whether they're from the pediatric side or the internal medicine side, all of them trying to get a little bit or dermatology, things like that. People who want to get some more exposure to allergies and, uh, and yeah. the immunology clinic in general. So that's basically my role down here. So it's, it's kind of cool because I get to do things both on the clinical side, treating patients just like you guys. And I kind of have uh, a partial focus on education as well. What made you want to get into um, allergy? Yeah, well, I think um, I'll probably start off just with my journey through medicine, you know, sure. uh, just like everybody. It all starts with just deciding that you want to be a physician in the first place, that you want to be a doctor. And then you always choose your subspecialty later on uh, based on just your experiences and some of the things you, you learn about as you're going through medical school. So in my case, my journey started in childhood, both my parents being physicians. It was always the thing I grew up around and felt comfortable with, which is not to say that everybody in my family chose that path and people, including my sister, have gone down other paths. Uh, but I think that in choosing to do medicine was the first step in that process. And then, of course, allergy, immunology, what I like about it is, so going back to the whole personal history thing, I grew up with exercise-induced asthma. I was later diagnosed with something called eosinophilic esophagitis, which is yeah. uh, a disease of the esophagus that's related to allergies for people who are non-physician listeners here. So that piqued my interest. And then going through my 
medical school and then internal medicine residency, I was really fascinated with the immune system, the fact that we have this system that you can't really, it's everywhere and it's nowhere at the same time, right? You can't right. really put your finger on the immune system, but it touches every single part of the body. It's fascinating. It's involved in every organ system. And really it's just now coming to light how important the immune system is and what all the mechanisms are that are involved in all these different diseases that, that you treat, that Dr. Cigar treats, uh, and that I really focus on and specialize in. And then the last part is the fact that as I was learning about the newer agents and the newer medications that are coming down the pipeline for us that are allowing us to treat a lot of um, formerly tough to treat diseases, things like, like advanced cancers, so many of them are immune based. I mean, even right. yeah, migraine treatment, we now have immune system based migraine treatments, Remarkable antibodies. Sure. you know, uh, things of that nature that and uh, I don't even need to talk about autoimmune disease, uh, severe allergies, things like that, that are, of course, going to be responsive to immune based therapies. But I just think that there's this whole world of immune based management and treatment that is just now starting to open up. And the clinical immunologists are going to have a huge role to play in that in the future. No, that's excellent. You know, your uh, story is not unlike mine. Both of my parents physicians as well. Uh, I'm sure, you know, I've been somewhat of a mentor to Clinton in his role through medicine. Ah. Um, so I'm just joking. But so yeah, did you, was it your parents? Age, uh, did, you have, did you have familial uh, pressure? I know I did. It's also a cultural thing. Um, sure. But luckily, it's the only thing I can see myself doing. So, how about you? When you have, when you grow up in that environment, sometimes some people feel forced to go into medicine. Other people say, "Man, this is the only thing I could ever do in my life." Yeah, I mean, right now, I would say it's the only thing I feel like doing. It's the only, it's the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, but I will say that one of the challenges when I was looking at uh, a career when I was, you know, um, in my younger days, I should say, uh, hmm. it. I, I really did like a lot of things. I wanted to consider a lot of different um, things that I was interested in outside of just physiology, biology, um, yeah. yeah, chemistry, things like that, things that you really have to dedicate yourself to early and be very focused on in order to pursue a career in medicine. And I, I, I understand, yeah, there's a, there is a cultural component to it with a lot of different cultures, especially people that grow up in uh, immigrant families to the U.S. Yeah. There's this prestige associated with being a doctor, but there's, there's that prestige outside of immigrant families too, sure. um, which, uh, you know, can um, attract a lot of people and make people feel like it's one of the only things that is reachable and that it is going to be desirable and, and make everybody uh, proud and happy. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I, in my case, you know, I'm happy with my decision. I think that, it was a very consciously made decision. It wasn't like I ever defaulted into it. I, I really did think about it beforehand and tried right. to really get a sense of if I go down this road, what do I want my life to look like? And how am I gonna also have some balance in my life and not just be pigeonholed as the doctor? You know what I mean? Right. Um, right. And to that effect, I know we're gonna talk a little bit later about what doctors can do as far as social media, but. There's a lot of doctors doing a lot of cool things that are not just putting on the white coat and seeing patients. We all do that, and I'm really glad that we all do that. And I'm and I, that's the main part of my career and you guys' careers. But as you can see, just by the fact that you guys are hosting this podcast, there's a lot more flexibility in terms of sure. what you can do with a medical degree, also than I would say that there used to be. And there's a lot of people really pioneering what it means to be a physician uh, in this time. Yeah, I think there's a whole growth that we can talk about, the whole growth of the side gigs, you know, physician side gig, entrepreneurship, media, um, uh, you know, not hustling, but moonlighting, doing a lot of different things. So um, I guess before we get into that, Clint and I were interested just in your, since we should touch upon it before we get to the more fun light stuff, is how you've been involved with COVID. I mean, Clint and I have talked at length about, um, obviously, the ID components, and I, I, I have been fortunate to run a lot of uh, clinical trials as a sub and, and PI for a lot of investigational therapies. Clinton's involved with some of the late-stage uh, ramifications of COVID and renal failure, but how have you been uh, involved with all this? Yeah, so from the beginning, I, I have always treated patients with, I mean, people in our specialty, we manage, in addition to allergies, we manage people with immunodeficiencies, so people that have weaknesses in their immune system that right. when they, let's, if they were to encounter COVID, they, their immune system doesn't have the same ability to fight off 
run-of-the-mill infections, let alone a curveball infection as we've found out COVID to be. So that's something that I've been involved with from the very beginning, counseling my patients, trying to stay on top of the literature, uh, the latest literature with regards to immunodeficient patients and their experiences with COVID, and really trying to um, reinforce the precautions that the extra precautions that that patient population needs to be taking, even relative to the general population and all of our common sense precautions that we've been doing now for 14 months and to some extent we're still doing. Sure. Uh, and then more recently, I would say with the COVID-19 vaccines that have been developed, there again, same questions have been coming up with the immunodeficient population. Should they get the vaccine? How effective is the vaccine gonna be for them? And additionally, there's this other population of patients who are having what seem to be allergic anaphylactic reactions to the vaccines. So right. me and my colleagues, one of the other things that we've been doing is trying to pursue testing strategies and ways to get those patients who have allergic reactions the second dose of the vaccine safely or try and test them before they get the first dose of the vaccine um, to see whether they can proceed with it and, and kind of help guide decision making on that side. And so right now I have to ask, is there's no test available to predict, because we get it all the time, Clinton does a fair amount of internal medicine as well, and people ask with both of us, you know, how do you predict? It's not like there's an egg allergy, a latex allergy right. associated with these messenger RNA vaccines. So there is currently no uh, risk factors or determinants that suggest that someone may have a type one IgE media anaphylactic reaction to, to uh, I'm, used to, I'm used to saying beta lactams, yeah. messenger RNA uh, uh, vaccines. Well, I don't want to get too technical here, but really the only risk factor is if you've had an allergic reaction to another medication, an injectable medication or an oral med medication that contains this molecule called polyethylene glycol, which is the stabilizer molecule yeah, inside right. of the COVID mRNA vaccines. So people that have allergic reactions to other HEG, which is what polyethylene glycol is what it's short for, uh, people who have had allergic reactions to other PEG-containing medications are at risk of having an allergic reaction to the mRNA vaccine. And there is a test for them. That test can really only be done in a dedicated allergist's office. And not every allergist is doing it. It's just certain allergy offices that are offering that yeah. test. But I, I don't know. Um, what Are there other vaccines that like, what, what, what if you're talking to a patient, like uh, what kind of questions could you ask them? Like what other medications have you had mm -hmm. allergy reactions? Are there common ones that have polyethylene glycol in it? Yeah, so there are a few chemotherapy drugs. So anybody who's had it really, I mean, I, I think we get referrals from just, if anybody has had a uh, anaphylactic reaction to an injectable chemotherapy medication, we go through screening with them uh, as far as that goes. Things like PEG interferon, which can be used sometimes to treat uh, hepatitis. Right, um, right. Yeah, so, so those kinds of, uh, they're, they're not the most commonly used medications, but they do- But it's not like if you had the flu shot and you had a no. reaction, you're going to get a reaction to the COVID vaccine. Um, no, because uh, so PEG is not, it's really the mRNA vaccines are the first vaccines that have PEG as a stabilizer. Mm -hmm. right now. We really didn't talk about the new news about the co uh, CDC's recent guidance on mask wearing. And I'm curious to see what the, my shiny head colleague has to say about uh, not having to wear masks if you've been vaccinated. And do you think that Americans are reliable enough to go based on that honor system? Because there's no real way to prove that you had the vaccine. Um, they've been fabricating cards. So uh, what, what say you? Well, I mean, I'll give, I'll, we'll, we'll see what the immunologist has to say, but very clearly uh, the federal government early on said they're not going to require, um, require like a vaccine passport or what have you. So the honor system is ridiculous because if you think about it, uh, the people most likely not to get vaccinated are probably the most likely not to wear masks. So right. it does come down to education and some degree of trust. And I'm sure uh, Basel's patients, you know, that are immunosuppressed, uh, uh, you know, may be counseled to continue to wear masks in the near future since we have not achieved herd immunity as of Tuesday, only 36% of Americans are fully immunized. And, you know, we've talked about herd immunity. I don't think we're going to actually reach that. It's a moving target based on the variants. But, uh, you know, one thing I'll ask you, because we're actually doing a small pilot study with MS patients, but patients who are on, on biologics. So for those yeah. that out there that aren't physicians that are on monoclonal antibodies, or other therapies, we have seen several who did not mount a response. Uh, after getting fully vaccinated. So we checked their two types of antibodies, nuclear capsid, as well as their anti-spike protein, uh, and particularly working uh, with uh, some of my uh, neuro colleagues who specialize in MS. 
And we're seeing that they actually got COVID. They had a mild case, but they had no antibody response whatsoever. So are you, um, in your literature, in your uh, patient population, are you looking at people who are immunocompromised, not from steroids, but really from either biologic, et cetera, and s assessing their response after getting a vaccine? That's really interesting. I'll be really interested to see what the results of your pilot study show. Sure. But yeah, the literature that I reviewed does seem to show similar to what you said, that they don't really mount the same antibody response as non-immunocompromised patients. And that's the, the largest study that's been done on this so far was done at Hopkins, came out a couple of weeks ago in JAMA, where they looked at solid organ transplant patients who were immunosuppressed on different immunosuppression regimens. But they actually found that among younger patients, only less than half, 48%, showed antibody responses. And then among older adults, it was a third, 33%. Right. They actually demonstrated an antibody, or maybe it was 35. It was somewhere in that range that actually demonstrated an antibody response after vaccination. So that is a real phenomenon. I think that we need to keep in mind a couple of things though. Is, is one is that antibody immunity is not the only type of immunity that exists. So there is right. still utility. There's still a good reason to vaccinate these patients because they may still have cellular immunity against COVID that we're not measuring, that it's just too labor intensive to even try yeah. uh, and measure that. Um, and then I think that that um, it, it's tough to say because, you know, the there's no clearly defined antibody level that tells us this is the point at which you're protected, right? Exactly. Somebody may have somebody may have positive antibodies and not be protected against COVID because they're not high enough. It's not like a protective level. Another person may have no antibodies, but they may have enough cellular immunity to be able to really protect themselves against the virus. So there's that kind of leads me into another point that I wanted to make with you guys today, sure. which is that just from an academic standpoint, I don't want to downplay any pandemic that's serious and that's awful and that's clearly uh, had a lot of negative effects on a lot of people's lives and, and unfortunately has killed a lot of our fellow citizens uh, and people around the world. But from an academic standpoint as an immunologist, I'm very excited to see what we learn about the immune system in the next 10, 20 years, and maybe beyond right. that, that's happened as a result of this virus, because you really think about it. I mean, there have been so many different responses to COVID. Some people are purely asymptomatic and have risk factors. Other people are seemingly healthy and have a horrible outcome from it. We're also now seeing this long COVID population. Yeah. And how do you explain that immunologically when the virus appears to be gone, but the symptoms are still present and it's long past the point where you would think that somebody would recover. So, I mean, just like a generation ago, we had the HIV virus, which was awful and destructive and was a horrible epidemic in its own right. But it taught us a lot of lessons about the CD4 T cell, which uh, I know uh, you guys are familiar with, but for non-medical people, CD4 T cell is a a very crucial component of the immune system. Some people call it the quarterback of the immune system, although I reject that characterization, but that's another story. But still, the point is that from this virus, we're gonna learn a lot about the immune system and hopefully it's gonna give us a lot of direction about how, how we respond to not only future pandemics, but just how we understand our own uh, bodies and our own body's ability to fight off diseases in the future. Yeah, I'll just piggyback on that. I know Clinton had another question, but you know, when this took off, uh, this was almost like our evolution of knowledge was in real time, right? I mean, uh, for any medical physicians out there, you know, when this really hit, as I say, shit hit the fan last year in March, we had no data. We were looking at the Chinese, you know, their experience. And, uh, you know, we were using things like, like everywhere else, hydrochlorothiazide, uh, you know, hydroxychloroquine. We were using old HIV drugs like Kalitra protease inhibitors. And then, you know, we really quickly realized this had no efficacy. And then, of course, we went to remdesivir, monoclonal antibodies, steroids, anticoagulation, blah, blah, blah. But you're right. So it, it, this has been evolving right as we've gone along. And so now, as you know, when we realize we can take care of the acute situation, but this long COVID or now you call it post-acute sequelae of COVID, I mean, that's clearly mm -hmm. some immunological reaction that we haven't captured quite yet in terms of why this happens, why people get lo you know, loss of taste and smell and brain fogginess. I mean, COVID, I think Clinton has brain fogginess all the time, but you know, who knows? Maybe he had yeah. COVID, we don't know, but is that, is that possible? But I would say it's just a reflection of all our, our disciplines of medicine really getting together. It's really amazing. Just like with HIV, with this explosion of scientific discovery, same thing here with COVID, you know, whether it's our pulmonologists learning how to manage patients on the vent and, and, and the mm -hmm. 
these of COVID patients that are intubated with ID and all our clinical trials. So um, you're right. We do have a lot of optimism uh, going forward. Just the, yeah. um, just the technology put into the vaccine, like the, the efficacy. We don't do, are there other vaccines that are just as efficacious? It, it seems pretty, like, compared to like the flu and the, everything else, but just you know, for a virus that's so widespread, the, the impact of the vaccine, I thought was really profound. I totally agree. I, I don't know of any other virus that is that efficacious, both in terms of uh, infection prevention and in terms of reducing mortality. And what's really cool about that is the fact that they, and this is going to play into some people's hands that I, I really don't want it to, but the fact that they were able to sequence the virus and right. develop a vaccine from it a year or less than a year later is a really remarkable technological feat. Yeah when you think yeah. about it, it's, it's, I mean, as a blueprint for future uh, vaccine development or, or future treatment based on mRNA, I think that that's also pretty amazing when you think about it. You know, that bears reminding, I mean, this was reported to the WHO December 31st, 2019 by, I think, January 14th, the oh. entire uh, genomic sequence was made available. Oh. And you're right, you don't want to play it in the wrong hands. And this is a reflection of the Human Genome Project and how quickly we can do uh, PCR and sequencing. So this is not some kind of, well, we already had in the bank somewhere, you know, just right. waiting. But you're right. And you went from there. And luckily, and because people ask me, I'm sure they ask you, hey, doc, uh, isn't it kind of crazy? Because I think Clinton and I want to talk to you a little bit about vaccine hesitancy and some other things, mm -hmm. but, and then, and then transition to social media. But, um, you know, people ask me and ask him that, you know, should we give our vaccine to ourselves and now our kids? And isn't it strange that this vaccine is available so quickly? And so, I think you can maybe touch upon this, but this technology has been brewing for years and years, right? Since actually the early 2000s, these two German scientists who were really kind of hallmarked, uh, who were really the, uh, the, the stallmark behind, uh, you know, the messenger RNA technology. But I think we should just realize how lucky we are that this was available, the sequence was available and how, you know, just incredibly intricate and, and, and profound uh, the technology is that you can just take and, you know, it's almost like we have the hardware and now you just keep changing the software. Right. Uh, yeah, that's a great take. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, we we have this hardware, we have this foundation of uh, a right. process, a blueprint, and it's just a matter of rewriting the code in such a way that it, it fits with uh, whatever the situ the certain situation calls for. But I yeah, I would echo what you said about we've had this technology for a long time from a basic science standpoint. Really, I think it was uh, it's been studied since the early '90s, and I think the first large scale clinical trial that was done with an mRNA vaccine was in 2012 or 2013. Mm -hmm. So we have pretty much almost 10 years of safety data now uh, showing that there's there's good, not only short-term outcomes with this particular vaccine, but long-term safety as far as the use of mRNA vaccine technology. You can see how uh, doctors and scientists can be amazing when they want to. I just wonder why they can't uh, cure male pattern baldness. I'm looking <laughs> at uh, Dr. Sugger. You know what? Oh, oh, thank God my head is round. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> You're okay. But you don't realize I could I could have nice hair like Dr. Kowash. I just basically choose you to choose not to. I right. choose, man. I choose it. Yeah. Um, like let, let's let's move on to something happier. Um so Dr. Sagar, he, he really wants to get into social media and he, he started minute, wait, a TikTok wait, wait. account, all that stuff. And is that right? He still has MySpace. No, you no, have no, any let, let, for him? Let, let me set the basis of where we're at and then you need to help us. Um because well, we, we talked about before, you know, we're going to try to make it a little lighter now uh, of this whole idea of social media and physicians doing other things. And, and Clint and I have been fortunate to do a lot of things, um, not like you in an academic level, but at a more community based level. We do, uh, you know, we've been teaching medical students and residents and actually our, our institution is actually looking at developing a community based residency in a couple of years. That, so Clint and I will be involved with that. So that's the education component, which is great. You know, we do research, we do other things. The podcast has been a great creative outlet. Mm -hmm. But we do a fair amount of media. We were both fortunate enough to uh, be medical uh, contributors for Fox 5 in New York City. Sure. But we realized, hey, you know what? Uh, there's a lot of people on social media. Should physicians be on social media? Should I be there dancing, doing the shuffle dance on Instagram Reels? Should I be doing something else? You know, should I just post pictures of my dog? So can you kind of give an idea of like where, where do social media fit in a professional uh, setting uh, for physicians? Well, it's not for me to tell somebody how to use social media. I mean, I, I would love to see your shuffle dance, uh, <laughs> but it's not really my cup of tea. I can't really, you know, you don't want to see me try. 
no, to okay. attempt to do it. And but I do have medical colleagues that that dance that you know like to use that platform or their other talents to try and convey a medical evidence based message, which is fantastic. So. Right. It's not so much about how you use social media, but I do think that absolutely doctors need to take an active role. The one, as long as you feel comfortable doing it, you need to take an active role and you need to be visible on social media because we've all seen patients come into our offices and they're getting their information from, I mean, they're only seeing us in their clinic or right. in our clinic for 15, 30 minutes tops right. every few months or, or once a year, maybe potentially. The rest of the time they're getting their information from different media sources, including their social media feeds, which they're probably scrolling through every single day, possibly multiple times a day. So rather than try and put out the fires or, or the uh, potential misinformation or the misunderstandings, right. just to be generous towards people, the misunderstandings that we encounter in our offices and feel like we're playing whack-a-mole every single day, we really need to be proactive with our messaging and try and reach yeah. the wider public before they come into our offices as doctors and yeah. really be responsible and mindful about how we're educated. You mentioned education earlier. I mean, you can look at that as a, another educational responsibility, right? We train future physicians, we train students in health professions, but we can also help to educate our wider population. And I think social media is a great platform to do so. That's a great way to put it, putting out fires, because I, I, that's pro probably, probably my day-to-day -day activity is, mm. you know, either Dr. Google or some feed or some news article a patient has a mis uh, misconception about whether it's the vaccine or any any regular uh, disease. So that, that's a great way to put it. I, I think it's more of a way to um, get information out there in a, in a better digestible way. Because like you said, that once, twice a year, 15 minute appointment that's rushed and you, know, you got so many other things going on, that's not the ideal time to educate patients. It's also- Clinton, let me ask you, so you're right. But I guess my question would be, and I think what you're saying is that, you know, patients might be intimidated in a doctor's office and then that way they can digest this information um, in their own time, right? So they can listen to a podcast on the train, in the car. Um, they can watch uh, Dr. Coleman do a shuffle dance, you know, when they're doing jazzercise, whatever it might be. But I guess what my question is, is um, how, you know, is it better to be on Twitter? Is it better to be on LinkedIn? Obviously, you're, uh, you know, a bit younger than we are since you just passed your boards and I just recertified last year so you, 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 we clearly see it there's about a uh, well at least a 10-year difference but you know we all want to do the same thing so i guess we struggle sometimes with what is the best way to engage with patients um you know online yeah uh, again i think that the there are a lot of different ways to try and engage with patients and i have yet to encounter a platform where it's it's off limits uh, you have to maintain a certain amount of professionalism when you do it but some doctors really love using twitter there's this whole mid twitter hashtag med Twitter following. Um, and there's, of course, Instagram, which is has a little bit of a different flavor. Um, I've been more recently using Clubhouse the most simply because right. you can reach a, a you have a platform that's voice based, you can reach a wide audience. We do an all things COVID room every week, which I usually try and participate in, where right. we basically allow question and answers from it's a panel of physicians, we allow uh, question and answers from uh, different audience members, most of whom are just lay people trying to understand and trying to navigate this world of the pandemic through vaccines, through different kinds of uh, CDC uh, guidelines and, and through just their personal struggles. So can I think I, that- Can I interrupt you for a minute? Please. But do you think it's a response to, so we have a, 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 a COVID by, led by responsible physicians because you're competing against another room that has the anti-vaxxers. So it's like, do right. you think we would exist as a, as much as that we're trying to oppose some incorrect view? Because you see that on all, all the forms of social media too. We're spending a lot of our energy just trying to undo these these uh, misconceptions. So sorry to cut you off, but no, no, you, it's fine. I, it's a fantastic question. I, you know, I per, my personal approach to it, my thoughts on this are that. We just need to set up our parallel um, universe yeah. here and, and get out our messaging because if we're just reacting to misinformation and trying right. to correct what somebody else, I mean, not honestly, not all of it is even worth um, getting down into the, uh, the details of, unless somebody brings that to you and says that this is a personal concern of mine. But I don't think that we just need to be 
turn our um, social media platforms as physicians into correcting the mistakes of what the misinformation, what the misinformers are putting out there. I think that we need to be responsible for putting out good information more so than just reacting to bad information. Because I spend time telling patients that there's no microchip in the vaccine, like like stuff that you think is obvious, common really sense, has legs and just runs, and you spend so much time not even educating patients, but just correcting these crazy falsehoods. Yeah. Well, I think that's why it's worth talking about physicians on social media, because this is the first pandemic in history in the social media era, right? So we have a pandemic and we have a pandemic of misinformation, um, which we all clearly, I think anyone listening that's a physician, uh, have had to battle on a daily basis, whether it's computer chips uh, made in a Chinese lab, you know, other uh, uh, more nefarious type of, or sinister type of thoughts. Um, I don't know about you, but I think we've found that it comes from all different backgrounds of patients or, or even people we interact with. So it's very pervasive, you know, the, this, this, these myths and, and misconceptions. I think we owe it uh, to the, our healthcare, you know, uh, as, as a physicians and our, to our profession to battle on a daily basis. We do. And I honestly think it's always going to be an uphill battle. I mean, we're always going right. to be facing um, not only a lot of pushback and misinformation, but there's a lot of there are a lot of areas in public health in our society that we could be doing a much better job and a lot of messages that we could be doing a much better job reinforcing on a population basis. Another right. thing that the pandemic illustrated, at least to me, is just how important it is to uh, have this baseline of health because you know, patients who are, or individuals who are doing, like, if you're not a smoker, you're much less likely to have a, a really severe outcome. Uh, if you are exposed to virus, if you're somebody who is watches what you eat, if you're somebody who exercises regularly, all of these things, we're unfortunately lagging behind a lot of other parts of the world in our society in areas where we could be trying to improve baseline health among our population. If nothing else, we need to be getting that message across just as much as we need to be pushing back against misinformation. Also, just want to say, uh, Dr. Coleman, I listened to your uh, podcast interview with the fitness trainer and speaking of exercise, I heard that your favorite exercise is the single arm potato chip curl. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. It's that or something with a Popeye's fried chicken. Popeye's sandwich. chicken. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. We actually, Drum we stick. actually have been invited to go back, but I don't think, uh, Dr. Sugger is. Uh, I'm ready, man. Ready. I'm ready to go. Let's do it. You know I mean? Uh, he, uh, we, you know, we, we, if you, if you're afraid of all competition, then that, that's not, that's on you, you know? So, uh, but Dr. Kawhi, where can people one. find you? Um, you? You mentioned uh, Clubhouse, but where else? What are your social media handles? Well, uh, aside from Popeyes, hopefully with you two someday in New York, I'd love to meet you all there for a bucket of drumsticks. But uh, <laughs> my socials, you can find me on Twitter at Basil, B A S I L M D zero, or on Clubhouse at Basil M D. Uh, and uh, I'm also on LinkedIn. People can connect with me there. Awesome. And Doximity, if you have a physician audience here. Ah, oh, Doximity. Yep. I should just say Clinton is still in America online, right? Or MySpace? Are you still on there? It's the messenger. He probably doesn't even know what that is. I do. Remember you had to wait for the dial-up, the phone? Yeah, 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 yeah. With the door opening sound? Yeah. Right. Yeah, the download it, stuff. You leave and come back and it still be downloading. You right. take a nap for two hours and you come back and still downloading. So. Yeah. And then we now we complain when our sick, when we don't get good signal or... It takes forever to refresh a page. We're, we're privileged. We are. We're lucky. Indeed. Yeah. And I'm privileged to have had this conversation with both of you. I really appreciate it. No, we, re we very much appreciate some of your caliber coming on, discussing a wide variety of things. You know, the only thing we regret is not having more time. But, I mean, we want to talk about nitty-gritty science. We also talk about some of the social issues and some of social media. I think it, it's, it's so important is what's on everyone's mind. So we very much appreciate your perspective and your thoughts. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Kwash. We were very fortunate to have you on the show today. My Myself, pleasure. Dr. Stocker, and my ever-present co-host and brother in arms, Dr. Clinton Coleman. Uh, until next time, be safe and be well. You as well. If I ever get a TikTok, I'll let you guys know. <laughs> All right.